Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is. I'm Peter Whittle. Now, my guest today last appeared on the programme last year, hugely popular, as indeed she should be. Anne Widdicombe uh, is a fixture in our public life. She was also, of course, Shadow Home Secretary uh, for the Conservative Party and more recently uh, Brexit Party MEP in the European Parliament. Uh, good morning to you, Anne. Morning. Good to see you. Um, let's go in at the deep end. We recently had the local elections and the mayoralty elections and a by-election, so-called Super Thursday. Um, there's been a hell of a lot of comment about this in the press. Do you think this is the end for the Labour Party? I doubt it very much. I can remember in uh, 1992 when we had won an unprecedented fourth term and uh, everybody had been expecting us to lose. They'd been expecting Labour to win. We had a boundaries review coming up and the conversation in the House of Commons at the time was well, it's difficult to see how Labour can ever win again, because if they couldn't win in those circumstances, when can they win? Uh, and the boundaries review will be in favour of the Conservatives. Uh, and so that's probably the end for Labour. Well, as we all know, five years later, Blair came in with a record landslide and stayed there for another 13 years. Well, Labour stayed there for another 13 years. So I'm very cautious about saying of any political situation prevailing today, this is it, and this is going to prevail forevermore. However, if uh, you're asking me, is there the possibility um, that this is the end for Labour, then I would say, I will say that when you tell me what you are going to put in its place, we're not going to have a one party state. So what are we going to have as the official opposition? I think the bigger question is, what is the future role for Labour? I mean, at the moment, it's resolved itself into a sort of a woke role, if you like. It speaks for a metropolitan elite. It speaks for Remain. It's miles, miles away uh, in understanding from its own heartlands. Uh, and this was really exemplified in Hartlepool. Hartlepool was a seat that voted 70 percent, I mean 70 percent, huge, to leave uh, in uh, the 2016 referendum. And then in the 2019 general election, Hartlepool actually gave the Brexit party candidate more than 10,000 votes. Mm. And if you added those on to the Conservative vote, it comfortably exceeded the Labour vote. So you would have expected Labour to say, right, what do we have to do to address the concerns of this seat? Instead of which, they put in a Remain candidate and, and a really, you know, very, very strongly Remain candidate, not somebody who'd just sort of been vaguely either way, somebody who'd supported a second referendum. They put in a Remain candidate. Now, that is as good as saying, we don't care what mm. you think, we know better. Mm. We are the elite. You, 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 you don't know your place. That is Labour's problem. The role of representing the working man, um, as was vitally necessary at the turn of the last century, had by the turn of this century pretty well disappeared, mm. uh, had become redundant because uh, there is now a general acceptance of, uh, about welfare and, and benefits and looking after people and, and, and jobs. There is now a general consensus uh, across the parties. Labour lost its unique position. Um, now it's got to find another unique position. Um, but if you ask me if, if it's the end, then my answer would be, do you really think we'll become a one party state? And I don't. I think uh, also uh, around about uh, the turn of the century, people were actually writing off the Tory party as being in, you know, in an impossible position. I remember there was a book came out which was called The Strange Death of Tory England by Geoffrey Reecroft. Uh, it was very much, you know, this was it. This was the new country under Blair. So, and in fact, and then what happened is the Tory party came back, admittedly under a coalition to begin with. What, what do you make of Keir Starmer? What's your personal opinion of Keir Starmer? I think he is not going to be an effective leader for Labour. It's very difficult to know what he does stand for. And let me say right at the outset, I do understand why 
at the beginning of the COVID crisis, uh, he more or less had just accepted everything that Boris was saying. I understand that because if you have a, a, a war or you have some big international catastrophe, then traditionally the parties do stand together in the national interest. But as time went on, it became obvious Boris was making mistakes. Boris was uh, flip-flopping between policies. Boris was fludging. Boris was failing. And yet, Keir Starmer never used that to press home the questions which the nation was asking. So there we were, all the nation wanting to know why we can't come out of lockdown earlier uh, because of the success of the vaccines. And what does Keir Starmer use Prime Minister's question for? Talk about wallpaper. I mean, wallpaper, <laughs> as if they gave tuppence for the wallpaper in Hartlepool. They're completely disconnected. Mm. It's Westminster Village stuff, Westminster navel gazing, uh, and Keir Starmer I just cannot connect with what his own people want. Yes. Can you, what do you think as well, something that seemed to really make people angry uh, was when he took the knee, you know, during the Black Lives Matter protest. And also for that matter, we have this sort of thing whereby a, a front bench spokesman for Labour uh, was talking about the fact that when babies are born, they don't have a sex, things like this. I mean, surely this, this kind of thing is what turns people off entirely. Uh, that is absolutely true. Um, and in fact, the Conservative Party was infected with this uh, mm. not so very long ago. And I, I think Boris has at least uh, managed to, to turn the emphasis away from that. Uh, but it's quite true um, that they, what Labour do is that they adopt every fashionable cause that is going uh, and focus on that. And they don't understand that out there where people are worried about jobs and keeping their houses and their mortgages, uh, where that's what people are worried about, they don't understand, they don't give tuppence for this talk uh, about, well, you're not born in any particular sex, you know, which to most people is arrogant nonsense. Yeah. I think it's arrogant nonsense. In fact, it, yes, it is nonsense, but um, what do you think of the view that, in, that this vote was not just about uh, the vaccination. It wasn't just about, well, the residuals of Brexit even, but that in fact it was also a vote against what people hear on a daily basis, the woke agenda, what's happening in our schools, what's happening in our universities, that this is what actually they're also protesting about. Yes, I mean, I, I, I think that is undeniably true. I think that Labour has lost all contact with, with the realities that most people are facing. Uh, and I think people are concerned about free speech, for example. Uh, they're concerned about the stories they read in the newspaper of J.K. Rowling, for yeah. example, being deep platform, um, or people trying to say she shouldn't be allowed to publish a fairy tale because she said something uh, about transgenderism and no connection between the two. Uh, I think people are fed up with being bossed about uh, yeah. by, by the woke minority, and it is a minority. And that is something which I think neither major political party has understood. Yes. Actually, and that takes me on to a, an important point. You say both parties haven't kind of realised this. this. This is an extraordinarily important thing. What should the, what would you like to see the government doing or the Conservative Party doing to counter this agenda? We, when we last spoke, we were talking about the hate crime bill going through Scotland and you were very clear about that, about, you know, not being able to talk about what you want in your own home. Um, what what would you like to see them do to actually counter this this apparent insistent agenda, which seems to brook no opposition? Well, they've taken a sort of half step, if you like, in the Queen's speech. Uh, where they're going to actually come down quite hard on universities which de-platform and, and discriminate against people on the basis of their views. But why on earth just the universities? Now, I know that's where it can be at its worst and that it's very dangerous if young people get into that habit. Um, I do understand that, but nevertheless, 
this is something that affects everybody. Mm. People can't get gigs if they say the wrong thing. Um, they're theatre tours, and don't I know it, are cancelled if they say the wrong thing. Uh, and so we need this to stretch well beyond the universities. There has to be a free speech guaranteed by law, which once I would never have thought we would have had to say in this country, yeah. but now we do. We need to guarantee free speech by law, and that must be backed up with penalties, which will really bite and make people think twice. Have you been cancelled or deplatformed, Anne? Yes, I have. Um, only once on any scale, uh, but it was shortly after the um, elections for the European Parliament uh, in 2019, uh, and I was interviewed on Sky, uh, and uh, I was asked in the, in the course of that interview uh, about my views uh, on gay rights and specifically, very specifically, uh, about uh, whether people should transition sexuality. And I said, you know, well, it can't be done at the moment, but we once thought that you couldn't um, change a man into a woman or a woman into a man. So presumably, you know, at some stage, science might be able to. That was all I said. I didn't pass a value judgment on whether it would be a good thing or a bad thing. I certainly never used the word cure. I wouldn't have dreamt of it. Uh, and uh, But it was reported in inflated terms. I mean, really inflated terms. And I suddenly started losing. I was doing a theatre tour. I suddenly started finding my theatre appearances cancelled uh, because people had protested that I should be um, invited. Now, what was I talking about on those tours? Strictly come dancing. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, brother. Yeah. wasn't talking mm. uh, about uh, uh, that issue. And if, if I hadn't been asked about it in the interview, I would never have raised it, wouldn't have dreamt of raising it. And I didn't say the things that people believe I said, even though it's there on the record, they can check for themselves. And in fact, I was doing an interview some months afterwards with Ian Dale, who is, of course, openly gay. Uh, and he and I are friends. And I said to him on air, I said, Ian, if I thought one quarter of what people say, I think, uh, would you want to know me? And he said, no. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, but I couldn't help the exaggeration. That was not within my uh, uh, control. Uh, but I had to pay the penalty. Now, I think the law should have protected not only me because i'm retired and these things you know they are not going to determine my livelihood or my ability to pay a mortgage or to keep my family in food I'm not going to do anything like that but for hundreds of people that's exactly the impact it would have you mentioned there about the uh various legislation or proposed legislation the government's bringing in about universities but what about our schools and i am concerned by the level of quite blatant indoctrination happening how on earth do you tackle that how would you tackle that well the problem with what is going on in our schools is that it actually it is deleterious to young minds mm. Uh, young minds should be taught rigorously how to analyse and deduce and argue with people who take a different view um, without seeking to suppress different views. That, that is what education should do. It should train you to analyse, reach your own conclusions, whether they are shared by the vast majority um, or whether they are only shared by a tiny minority, but reach your own conclusions, but defend other people's rights to reach their conclusions mm -hmm. that is what education should be about and but the thing is is that it appears that children are now sort of leaving almost you know well they're sort of being told what to think as opposed to how to think i i, I think this is one because education is at the root of all of this is it not yes it's absolutely the root of it um connected to that we have this leveling up agenda by the government. This is the one that the media likes because the media hates talking about cultural issues on the whole, uh, or rather doesn't think they're important, but they certainly do think economic ones are. Um, would you say that, for example, one way of levelling up would be to make sure that every town or every city had a grammar score, for example? 
Oh, I think you must have been reading my Express column, which I wrote on Wednesday. No. <laughs> yes, I think you did. Uh, and as I said on Wednesday, um, grammar schools provided a route and possibly the only route that there was for the bright child in a deprived background to get out of that rut and to get on. And I was very fortunate when I was a member of parliament um, that I represented a seat which still had the 11 plus and grammar schools. And when the Labour Party uh, took power, they wanted to ballot uh, areas which still had grammar schools to ask if they wanted to keep them. They couldn't even get enough signatures to trigger the ballot because really? there was huge support for the grammar schools by parents whose children hadn't gone to them, but who wanted to feel that if they had made the grade, they could have had that education. Mm. Now, I used to go into grammar schools, be children from all sorts of backgrounds there. Um, it, the, the thing that united them was intelligence, mm. and they were being given an education that reflected uh, that. Uh, and if you want to get on, education is the first big step. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, I, as I said on Wednesday, I think we should have a grammar school in every single town. But if Boris wants to get started, and he can't do it all in the lifetime of this parliament, if he wants to get started, let's start putting them in the northern towns. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's got to be a will, hasn't there? This is the point. And there's, there's got to be the will to do this. This is where one gets frustrated. Often it appears the will is, will is very weak, you know. Um, staying on the elections a little bit, uh, you know, we've had this extraordinary Tory uh, success. Where do you think this leaves the smaller parties? Um, Am I right? You, you can tell me, you, you supported in London Lawrence Fox, I believe, right? I did. Yeah. Uh, well, there's Reform U UK, there's Reclaim. Um, it wasn't an impressive showing, was it? No, and it never is for little parties. Um, little parties, and the Brexit party was really uh, quite instructive as an exception to the norm, yeah. which is that little parties don't do well. Uh, because what people are asking themselves in a general election, particularly, and this is why the Brexit Party couldn't translate its success into that the last general election, what people are asking themselves is, who do we want to form the government? Mm. And if I vote for a little party, um, maybe the wrong big party will get in. You know, maybe I should give my vote to the party I, I want to get in. Um, which is a perfectly reasonable way of approaching things. I met it on the doorstep. I was standing as a Brexit Party candidate. I met it a lot on the doorstep. And however frustrated I was by it, I understood it fully, yeah. fully understood it. Yeah. So little parties don't have much success. But while we're talking about little parties, you know, the other day I really had to stop and think for the space of several seconds, who was the leader of the Liberal Party? <laughs> because they've just, oh, they've just, somewhere. I don't know where. Uh, and um, so uh, I, I don't see a future for small parties, regrettably, in many ways, regrettably. By the way, uh, I'm sorry, by the way, who is it actually? Ed Davey. Oh, right. Okay. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, as for reform, I... Um, <coughs> was hugely admiring of all that the Brexit party did, which is why I left the Conservatives after 55 years and joined it. And I still am hugely admiring uh, of the way that Nigel, n never having served in Parliament, nevertheless managed to get this country out of the EU. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm, I'm hugely admiring of all of that. But I think the Reform Party is going to struggle. What does it stand for? Well, it doesn't stand for Brexit anymore because in most people's eyes that's been achieved. I mean, you and I might have views on how it's been achieved, but it's been achieved. Um, Anti-lockdown, well, lockdown's about to finish. So what is the Reform Party's agenda? Well, it is at the moment electoral reform, you know, reform of the House of Lords, of reform of the voting system. Joe Bloggs in Hartlepool isn't interested. Uh, and that, I think, is, is, is something that, that has to be faced up to. Lawrence Fox, uh, I couldn't vote for him in London because I had no vote in London, but I would have done had I had such a vote. Uh, Lawrence Fox is campaigning for free speech. Now, I think that will eventually strike a chord, but he's not going to form a government. 
you know, so we have to face up to the fact that to get anything done, you have to persuade one of the big parties to do it. And that, I think, is what Lawrence must concentrate on doing. We must force this government to go further than it's uh, uh, signalled in the Queen's speech and to protect free speech. And as I say, I would never have thought that we would have had to say that in this country. We were once the very essence of free speech, the bastion of free speech, the country where you could say anything you liked, however much people disagreed with you. I, I would agree with you there, and I think that the role, say, like for Lawrence and the Reclaim Party, w would be uh, best, uh, almost like, you know, the Brexit Party, but for cultural issues such as free speech, you know, to act as a huge, like, pressure on the government, because I I've, I've, can't help but feel that they will get soft on this. Um, no, or not, or not, that they they, not that they've been that hard, I have to say. Um, we, you know, you, you're not in London, um, but... Do you think, what do you think of the mayoralty sort of system we have at the moment? It's a lot of people, you know, sort of, you hear these views. I've just finished, um, basically, I've just finished a stint on the London Assembly. I should just uh, declare that. But a lot of people are saying, oh, this system doesn't work. We should get rid of, you know, the London mayor. We should get rid of the Assembly, all of that. A bit like Thatcher did with the GGLC. Would you agree with that or not? I um, am in two minds about the system of elected mayors. I was very, very enthusiastic both about elected mayors and about elected police and crime commissioners uh, when it was first introduced, because I was uh, greatly impressed by what Giuliani managed to do in New York, yeah. you know, where he uh, uh, got crime down to a fraction of what it had previously been, it used to be you know, the highest crime rate in the world almost. Uh, and he got it right down and it was by imposing the zero tolerance policy and the word there is impose he had that sort of power our mayors and our police commissioners do not have that sort of power no, no. and i think that is what has gone wrong so they're just another layer of government you know, you've got your county councils, you've got your district councils, you've got your parish councils, you've got your police and crime commissioners, and you've got your elected mayors, and so on it goes. And it's just another layer. Whereas if a mayor had real serious Giuliani-style power, I would be all in favour of it. And then you could hold him to account because he either could or couldn't deliver. Well, speaking of layers of government, uh, to finish off, um, th th this is obviously a, another very big issue at the moment. That's the future of the Union, you know, of the United Kingdom, of Great Britain, Northern yeah. Ireland. Um, yeah. Do you think there should be an English Parliament? No, I do not think there should be an English Parliament. If you want to complete the breakup of the United Kingdom, just have an English Parliament and that will do it. Uh, it is crucial that we have, um, I mean, if you look at the vote on Welsh devolution, you know, only 25% voted for an assembly, 75% either voted against or stayed at home, didn't mm. vote at all. Mm. Uh, and so, um, and in other words, didn't feel strongly at all. Uh, and I strongly believe in the United Kingdom and I don't want it fractured any further. And I think the union is in peril. And oddly, I'm less worried about Scotland than I am about Northern Ireland. Mm. Because what Boris has done is create a, and it is Boris, you know, this was his deal create a border down the Irish Sea uh, and effectively now Northern Ireland is being treated as if it's part of the EU instead of part of the UK mm. um, and you know it's easy to see that in a few years time people might say well you know if we're not part of the UK why pretend to be yeah, yeah, yeah. why pretend to be yeah, yeah. so I, I am severely worried about Northern Ireland I'm much less worried about Scotland because I think Scots are canny actually um, when it comes to it, you'll get exactly the same result as you got last time. Yeah. Uh, and, and people will say, no, you know, they, they, they don't want to leave. But also there is a principle at stake with the Scottish referendum, which is the one that we had to face down over Brexit, which is that abuse of referendums, as far as I'm concerned, whereby you go on having them until you get the result you want. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that we must not countenance. You have a referendum, that's it. It was said that would settle it for a generation. Mm. It didn't go beyond a generation. Fine, that should now settle it for a generation. We've had the referendum. Yeah. 
But I think one of the worrying trends uh, generally in our democracy is the kind of delegitimization of votes, isn't it? it yes. There is this kind of we just simply don't accept. And, you know, with the, you obviously you were at the forefront with the Brexit uh, campaign after the referendum and um, as well, where people were talking about, oh, well, this generation's now died. And so, you know, oh, yeah. in fact, we've just reached the tipping point. I mean, it was, in fact, extraordinarily cruel, actually, what, what the way that people would talk. Yes, I, I mean, it was appalling. The, the, the attitude of the Remainers from the very moment that they lost the referendum was that somehow this isn't valid. Mm. You know, either the, um, the majority wasn't big enough. Well, no majority uh, was ever specified. We didn't say you have to get a two thirds or you have to get, you know, 56 percent. We didn't say anything like that. So it was perfectly valid. Absolutely valid. Yeah. Uh, then when they moaned about the, the narrowness of the majority, then it was, oh, well, patronising attitude, again from the metropolitan elite. Oh, well, people didn't really know what they were voting for. Mm -hmm. That is why I said at rally after rally to enormous cheers up and down the country, we knew exactly what we were mm -hmm. voting for. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and then there was this attitude, well, you know, let's have another referendum just to confirm that referendum. No. Mm -hmm. No, when the people speak, the politician's duty is to implement. Well, um, I mean, I have to say, my feeling is that the hell, frankly, that they put us through for those four awful years after the vote, uh, I don't think they should ever be allowed to forget it. You know, <laughs> you know, uh, re revenge is a, is a dish best served cold, they say. I mean, I, I, I have to say that, you know, when you think of all the claims that were made, not mm -hmm. one of them has come true, the, you know, of Project Fear. And I think they shouldn't be allowed to forget that. Do you think that's being vindictive of me? Yes, I do. <laughs> uh, and I'm a Christian, and I, I'm never going to talk about vengeance as a Christian. Uh, but what I am going to say is this, I actually think now, you know, we should take the line, the battle has been won. Yeah. I mean, I've got serious doubts about the Irish border, but, but the battle has been won. Uh, and therefore we must now move on. And I think there is a gradual growth in the country, not amongst the fanatical Remainers, or now they're the rejoiners. There never will be amongst them. But I think amongst the country as a whole, largely due to the vaccine debacle that we saw in Europe, um, then they were going to close the Irish border without even asking the Taoiseach. Then they were going to turn the lights off in Jersey. And the more they go on like that, I mean, I cheer them more power to their elbow because the more it will convince people in this country, oh boy, thank heaven we got out. And on that note, and uh, we will talk to you again, I hope maybe in about six months time. Um, yep. Thank you very, very much. Um, and um, I, I always draw attention, I know, but to this wonderful background of yours, which is like a, a bit like the monarchy, it's sort of secure Hands and off. continuous and it never changes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Anne. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's Thanks. it for this week on So What You're Saying Is, um, and we shall see you next time. Thanks.